Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! So now we move from emergent properties to renormalization theory, and um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Manfred Salmhofer. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Now for something rather different, um, I'm speaking for mathematical physics, C18, and. Uh, Before I actually start, I'd like to discuss a little bit what mathematical physics is. And uh, in my opinion, it is uh, about understanding the structure and the consequences of physical law in uh, depth and in mathematical depth, which means uh, specifically that if you have a model, then you really want to know what happens in this model, um, it is very important in many applications. So now, ideally, if you hear this, this should also lead to good computational schemes, but that's not always the case. This is a very uh, high, a tall order. And uh, apart from that, mathematical physics covers all physical phenomena, so it's not uh, specific to any single one of them and it touches all subfields of mathematics. Therefore, of course, I will not be able to give you an overview of the entire field. Um, instead, I will focus on a single topic, namely renormalization. And uh, I'd like to say I believe that in this area we're actually getting quite close to this ideal that I mentioned. So. Once upon a time, there was a land of dragons and knights. Um, here you see three of the most famous of them, creators of quantum field theory, famous Bogolyubov, Hepp, and Zimmermann. Quantum field theory started much earlier in the 1930s, and renormalization started then too. It got a disastrous reputation as some perverse trickery to sweep infinities under the rug. It has never lost that reputation, undeservedly so, because it's actually a theory that is based on physical principles 
like locality and unitarity, and which is very well founded mathematically, thanks to, among others, these people here. So history moves on, was already mentioned earlier today. There's also the renormalization group connected to critical phenomena, and I would like to highlight the three people, Kadanov, Wilson, and Wegner. Wilson got the Nobel Prize, and uh, I will discuss this type of renormalization a bit further in my talk. It is no exaggeration to say that this has shaped the way people think about many phenomena, not just critical phenomena. Okay, so now if you uh, have seen these two things, you may well ask yourself, do they have anything to do with each other? And in fact, yes. Um, you can view field theoretic renormalization as a special case of Wilsonian renormalization. And in fact, uh, the whole body of perturbative renormalization has been put into an extremely efficient form by uh, Polchinski and his followers. Um, so nowadays, when you want to give an all-order proof of renormalizability of a theory, you set up a certain flow equation. You don't actually have to look at Feynman diagrams anymore. It is a very slick and powerful method. Now, importantly, uh, this type of renormalization has also allowed for non-perturbative studies. And um, there is a large body of results, and I have selected a small number of people here. Just to uh, show them to you, I will not be able to give a review of all of this. So it is a very uh, useful method. And uh, also, we have had several Young Scientist Awards in our field, which were directly connected to renormalization. So, Alessandro Giuliani in 2012, and more recently in 2015, Roland Bauerschmidt and Joseph Benjelun have been working on very different um, physical models, but they have been using very similar methods. Okay. Enough of these faces, let's now start looking at decent formulas. So, um, of course, statistical mechanics is about uh, partition functions and expectations, so you integrate over degrees of freedom. Usually, you take a limit of infinitely many of them to get true phase transitions. So you have these phi alphas, and uh, we weight them by an action, uh, by a Boltzmann factor, e to the minus action. And uh, the phase transitions arise when you take very many degrees of freedoms, or infinitely many. Now, this integral can also be a sum, and uh, the Drosophila of statistical mechanics is the Ising model, where instead of an integral, you just have a sum over plus minus one spins, and you can have interaction which favors, let's say, alignment of the spins and external fields and all kinds of things. Now, for a magnet, this is not a very good model, but it's quite a good model for the adsorption of molecules and surfaces, for instance. And uh, the question of universality and critical phenomena uh, was also stu studied in this model. Okay, so, um, now we have to calculate an integral. And if you have always hated calculating integrals. Let me give you a method how you can in calculate the integral in the lab. Uh, so it's very easy. You just take it as a temperature distribution on some rod, and then you let the heat flow, and you rescale a little bit, and you will end up with the integral of the function f. This is, of course, a theorist's experiment. I don't think it is really practical, but it is at least theoretically interesting. The heat flow is generated by the heat equation, which you see up there. And it's, of course, solved by the Gaussian convolution. 
And you see in the Gaussian convolution, you have the time in the denominator of the exponent. So when time goes to infinity, this just becomes one. And up to the rescaling by a factor one over root t in front, this goes to the integral of the function. So now why is this interesting now? Because you can also look at intermediate stages of the heat flow, where you have averaged out your function a little bit on a certain scale, namely given by diffusion constant times time, or precisely the square root of that. And this is basically the idea of the renormalization group. You uh, average and look uh, what happens. So in an intuitive analogy, you look at your system with a microscope, you turn down the resolution, and since interactions can be inferred from correlations, um, you can also, in this way, determine a flow of the interactions of the system, which depends on scales. Now here, um, something for the theorists. It's really very easy. So you take your generating functional for uh, your field theory, which is written down here. Usually the action has a quadratic and a higher order part. The quadratic part is the one involving the Q here. And uh, so we want to calculate this integral. Well, what we do is exactly the same as before, except we introduce some scale instead of a time. Let's call that omega. And let's suppose the Q depends on omega, then it's trivial to differentiate this. You just get down the exponent. And then one does a little bit of field theoretical business, namely you rewrite this factor as a derivative with respect to source terms. And you can take it out and you see that this is a diffusion equation. D by D omega of e to the minus w is a Laplacian in field space applied to e to the minus w. So it is a diffusion equation in an infinite dimensional space. And if you work it out for the function w, for the exponent, that is an elementary calculation, you get the so-called nonlinear heat equation, and that is Polchinski's equation. So it's really something very simple. So this was the theorist's corner. This was the longest formula you will see in this talk. I wanted to show it to you to see, to tell you that it's really a straightforward analog of uh, the simple one-dimensional example. So now conceptually, this was a huge step because it transfers the study now from a single model to that of a whole family of theories. There is now a space of all theories. Now this is a grand concept you work in a space of all possible theories, and depending on the scale, you are at some point in this space, and you flow from a theory defined at a very small scale to one at a very large scale. And uh, universality is then explained in terms of fixed points and you know, uh, uh, basins of attraction and all that. Okay. So, there are some issues with this. If you implement a grand scheme, which is beautifully abstract, you have to be careful that it doesn't become nonsensical. So one can ask whether one knows anything about the space of all theories. Sounds almost like the set of all sets. And um, <clears throat> whether this flow actually exists, whether you have fixed points, um, whether you have global existence of the flow, and what the flow actually looks like. Flows can also be chaotic, they can have limit cycles. It is all uh, a very simple phenomenology if you look at it in, in this uh, general setting. So these mathematical questions have been addressed over time. There have been a few results about them. So for specific systems, one actually knows what the th uh, space of all theories is. It's a space of uh, a, a large class of models, and uh, the flows have been controlled around a few fixed points. There's basically no situation where one has mathematically proven a global flow diagram like the one I showed to you on the previous picture. 
But it is already interesting to understand the neighborhood of fixed points. And in fact, uh, this type of uh, renormalization group has become the most powerful method for uh, constructing field theoretical models mathematically. So in the following, I will discuss one particular application, namely to correlated fermion systems in condensed matter. So let's, to set the stage, what is the problem here? Um, <clears throat> we are mostly interested in the case where these systems are gapless. So uh, we have a Fermi surface uh, in a fermionic system. And uh, mathematically, this means that this function q, which I had in the exponent before, which you can now think of as a function of some parameter labeling the energies, epsilon alpha, in your system, that this function can become zero so that its inverse, which is the propagator usually in the field theory, becomes singular. So you have a small denominator problem just like in celestial mechanics or other theories. And if you uh, brute force start simple expansions, perturbation theory, you will get infrared divergences that look just as perverse as the ones in high energy physics. However, one can renormalize these theories too. And uh, the main difference, however, is that one doesn't have point-like singularities, you have surface singularities, and for that reason, renormalization changes quite a bit in general. If you have the a standard case of a um, spherically symmetric system, then it's all pretty similar. Well, not everything, but it's... Uh, well, no, it's not really similar, but you, at least the Fermi surface is a sphere. Um, but in general, of course, one would like to treat lattice systems and then the symmetries are reduced so much that one actually has to deal with functions. So it's called functional renormalization group, meaning, for instance, that one has to renormalize the Fermi surface. And the Fermi surface is an object, an extended object that deforms under the interaction. And to describe the deformation of a surface, you need a function, not just one parameter. Okay, and uh, so this uh, can be done, and it turns out that there is nothing perverse about it, because the counterterm function in this case is simply finite, and we, when you uh, work it through, then you find out that it actually just tells you how the Fermi surface deforms. So you get some physical information by this renormalization procedure. And uh, based on this, one can then go on and prove some mathematical statements about uh, condensed matter models. And I would like to um, highlight just a few of them. So there has been a lot of discussion about the concept of a Fermi liquid in the wake of uh, the high temperature superconductors. And uh, there was the claim by Anderson that Fermi liquid theory cannot be true in two dimensions. Uh, this claim has been mathematically disproven by these gentlemen listed up there, Feldman, Knara, and Trubowitz. They actually proved that there is a, a Fermi liquid in two dimensions. It's a very particular thing that they demand that the Fermi surface is not inversion symmetric. That has to do with removing the Cooper instability. So this is really zero temperature Fermi liquid where no superconducting phase arises. Now, of course, you don't want to always have to assume this asymmetry. So one can also ask questions about positive temperatures and uh, so under an appropriate natural definition of what a Fermi liquid is at positive temperature, one can then show that it is indeed uh, the case in the most natural systems, namely the one where uh, the energy is k-squared, so the continuum system, and a certain model called the Hubbard model 
provided that the density of the model is far away enough uh, from half filling. And, um, well, I have not, don't have very much time. Let me just say there are two remarks to be made. The first is an allusion to a title by Anderson. So, the infrared catastrophe does not trash Fermi liquid theory in two dimensions. This has been proven. And the second remark is that there is a lot of talk about the fermionic sign problem when you talk about fermions. And it turns out that in all this work, the fermionic signs are the thing that saves you not the problem, but the feature that makes everything very nice. It's an asset here. I cannot go into any of the details, of course. This would take a few hours. Okay, so now, we have been talking about fermionic systems. Here is the high TC phase diagram. So there are two, uh, actually, so this is an idealized phase diagram which is extracted from different materials. It's the typical diagram, uh, doping versus temperature. There's an antiferromagnetic phase, a superconducting phase, a pseudo-gap phase, which is a bit mysterious, and uh, a metallic phase here. So the results I was referring to would apply in this region here. So it is consistent with what one sees. On the left side, you see opinions of all the kind of things that could happen. Uh, and I will not go into these things. It's incompletely understood, obviously. And um, <clears throat> what we look at is the Hubbard model, the two-dimensional Hubbard model. And the Ising model was called the Drosophila. I would like to call this the Glossina morsitans, in case you don't know what that is. It's the CC fly. So the Hubbard model is the CC fly of correlated fermion models. Why do we call it like this, or I call it like this? If you look at Wikipedia, it says CC flies are physically very tough. House flies are easily killed by fly swatter. It takes a great deal of effort to crush a CC fly. The Hubbard model has not been crushed up to now, even though it seems so simple. Okay, so what is it? It's a model of hop fermions hopping on a lattice. Uh, I include here two hopping amplitudes to, ne near to neighbors and next to nearest neighbors. And there is a repulsion uh, whenever two fermions are on the same site. Um, which mimics the Coulomb interaction. It is proposed as a caricature of high TC superconductors. So here is what one gets when one does the RG on these models. So this is now a um, purely two-dimensional model, and we're using the renormalization group. It is the same method that is being used for proofs However, it is not exact because we have to do a certain number of approximations. These approximations appear plausible to us, but it's certainly not very far from being rigorously controlled. So what does it give? Well, it doesn't give us everything, but at least the things make sense. If you compare the true phase diagram with the one of the model, one clearly identifies one uh, region where one has antiferromagnetism, one can identify a region where one has D-wave superconductivity, and then there is a region in between where we actually cannot tell with our methods what happens. So at least partially one gets a sensible result, but the pseudo-gap phase remains a little bit of a mystery also with this method. And, uh, well, ARPES measurements show a certain uh, depression of quasi-particle weight in certain parts of the Brion zone. Well, the renormalization group also gives us that and for very specific reasons. Um, if you want to look at details, you can, for instance, look in this review which appeared a few years ago. There has been a large amount of activity. You can study many things, transport, equilibrium, 
and so on. Okay. Well, just to round things up, I would like to mention a few other applications. Uh, cold atomic gases have been studied. Many details have been worked out. The BAC PCS transition has been was mentioned yesterday. Uh, method, of course, works also for that and uh, gives very reasonable results. And there are many other things that people do with the method. For instance, in the cold atomic gases, there is an interesting uh, regime where one sees the Efimov effect, and the Efimov effect corresponds to limit cycles of the renormalization group. So there are cases where there are limit cycles in the renormalization group flows. And people use it for everything, for QCD, uh, particle physics, even for quantum gravity. Uh, Weinberg's fa famous asymptotic safety scenario for quantum gravity, saying that while the theory may be non-renormalizable perturbatively, there may be a fixed point um, away from the perturbative regime, um, seems to be viable according to the works of all these people here. Okay, so the outlook. Um, <clears throat> there are many things to do still. I think the major uh, things are that all the results I mentioned are weak coupling results. Real uh, materials and so on are not weakly coupled. This is a major problem. Um, and there are many other uh, things one would like to do on the mathematical side. So let's go to the moral of the story. I would like you to take home that renormalization is actually something very natural. There is nothing perverse about it. It is a powerful method. It is technically demanding, so that's why maybe why it's not very popular, but it works. And uh, there is a lot to be done for the future. Now, if you ask me why is it so powerful, I would say it is because it looks at changes and tracks them carefully, while these changes are still small. And if you adjust, this is the whole thing about the renormalization group flow, you adjust when you see a change, and uh, you can do this smoothly as long as they are small. If you neglect them, then you run into a disaster. Uh, then you run into singularities. Okay, so you can draw your more general philosophical conclusions yourself. Thank you very much. So I want to ask about um, the first kind of renormalization that you talked about, which, as you told us, was really a special case of the, the more general uh, uh, Wilsonian uh, renormalization. So if we think about uh, uh, quantum electrodynamics, as you said, uh, it has this reputation of uh, sweeping the infinities under the rug, but you assured us that uh, uh, there's nothing perverse about uh, uh, about the getting rid of the infinities. What I'm wondering is that another feature that is disturbing about quantum electrodynamics is the fact that if you treat it as a, perturba a perturbation expansion in higher and higher order Feynman diagrams, you can show that it doesn't converge. And nobody really worries about that because you get all the answers you want in the first uh, few terms where it's still uh, uh, convergent. Uh, but what I'm wondering is, does this more odd way thinking about renormalization get rid of the um, uh, the convergence as well? Uh, okay, so there's a long and a short answer to this. I'm 
sure I'm supposed to give the short answer. Um, the analysis goes via trying to understand this in detail. Uh, and the surprising thing is, uh, while it is correct that uh, perturbation theory in these models is typically divergent when you, um, when you look at the unregularized model, when you do the renormalization group, you can actually do it in a way that on each little scale change, you do have a convergent expansion. And the problem with QED then builds up in a particular way which is really specific to QED. Uh, it is very closely related to the famous Landau poll, meaning that the beta function in this uh, iteration, it has what one calls the wrong sign. So it gives a blow up, meaning that if you define your charge uh, at a certain scale and you try to take uh, the regulator to infinity, then you will uh, run into a singularity. Uh, it is believed to be a feature of QED by almost all people, meaning that QED is not a fundamental theory after all. <laughs> and uh, there are other theories like Young Mills theory in QCD where the beta function has the other sign and uh, those theories are ultraviolet perfectly fine. Uh, the other problem, the understanding problem is the infrared where you would try to uh, understand why confinement happens and uh, that's not understood yet. So would it be fair to say that the problem with QED is that the photon has zero mass or is it deeper than that? <laughs> the problem with QED is that the screening would screen the charge to zero. Screening is so strong and has a sign that the charge observed will always be zero, whatever you put. You could, you could put a very, very large charge and it will get screened just by vacuum polarization ah. so that you can't see it. Very nice.